of Tea uh, on Cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Simon Jeffries and I work as the Head of Technology for Complete IT and I'm also joined by Pratesh Mystery from ConnectWise who's a cybersecurity expert for them. Today we'll be talking about the current threat landscape of cybersecurity and Pratesh will kick that off for the first half of the webinar and then I'll discuss what Complete IT does for our clients and the areas that we recommend you address in order to make yourself as resilient as possible to becoming a victim of a cyber attack. So to kick things off, we'll hand over to Pratesh, but if any of you have got any questions, uh, please type them into the chat window and we'll aim to get to those after the webinar. Uh, alternatively, you'll be able to email questions in post the webinar and we'll provide an email address at the end of this. So Pratesh, can I hand over to you and you can please start your um, section on the current threat landscape. Cheers, Simon, and uh, thank you to Complete IT and, and, and team for having me on board and welcoming everyone to this afternoon's session. Um, yeah, we've got quite a lot to cover off today, so we will definitely start off on kind of, you know, what we'll be covering, I guess, on today's session more so is going to be, you know, why cyber, why now, and why uh, Complete IT, right, um, for this. So let's talk about some of the stats um, over the last few years, should I say. Um, and, and the first one will be, you know, I guess, look, every day there's, you know, usually around 65,000 attempts to hack, uh, you know, small business or small to medium sized businesses out there, which out of that, you know, in a recent study, 4,500 were successful. Um, and it was also reported in 2018 that one small business in the UK is hacked every 19 seconds. Right. We'll actually look at more recent figures as we go through um, the, the presentation today on, on this particular um, stat that I've just given to you. Uh, but the rest of the stats have been taken from May 2020 as an FYI. So, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, when we compare the UK to other parts of the EU um, and, you know, as we may not be as bad as some of the numbers uh, that are showing on there, like, for example, if we're looking at France, Italy and Germany there, uh, but it's still alarming numbers, like 88% of UK companies that have suffered a breach in the last 12 months. And that's a lot, you know, of companies out there uh, that have suffered that attack. And when we talk of some of the different types of attacks, like phishing attempts, uh, you know, are on the rise. We've seen, you know, one in every... Um, 3,722 emails in the UK is, is a phishing attempt, and that was according to Symantec. Um, and you know, nearly 55% of that is actually um, spam in the UK, right? That, that we're seeing as well. Um, a couple of other stats that I wanted to talk about as well. So, you know, around half of the cyber attacks in the UK involve phishing. Um, and you know, when we compare that globally, we are actually 20% higher than that global average number that's out there. 48% um, of UK organizations hit with ransomware in the last year. Um, you know, every other day I'm reading an article of a business um, that's been targeted, been hit with ransomware. Um, so, you know, this is not something that really, it's just the enterprise businesses that get targeted. There's a misconception out there, which, uh, you know, companies think that, um, you know, it's sort of the large organizations that will get hit with ransomware or um, phishing attempts. That's not the case. Um, it actually takes a bad actor more time, more resources to actually target the uh, enterprise businesses um, or the larger org organizations than it would uh, targeting a whole bunch of small to medium sized businesses. Right. Um, and, and that's been proven in the, num the numbers that we're seeing um, across the globe on that. Um, and then when we think of it, the average remediation cost of a successful ransomware attack to the UK enterprise is, you know, $840,000, again, higher than the global average um, of $761,000. Um, and then out of those 30% of UK companies uh, that have cybersecurity insurance actually doesn't cover ransomware. So if you guys are taking out um, cyber insurance, uh, it'd be one thing to look at uh, making sure that ransomware is actually covered under that policy, okay? When we look at the average payment that was demanded following a ransomware attack, um, again, this is a number taken from Q3 2020. Uh, the average number that you can see on the screen there was 233,000, call it 234. Again, more than, you know, half, 56%, I guess it was, of ransomware victims paid that ransom uh, to restore access to their data in, in, in that last year. And that was a study taken uh, by um, a security company 
uh, last year, like I mentioned. Again, think of it in this way, like if your business was targeted and you were hit with ransomware, could you be able to afford that? Like what damage, what impl implications is that going to do to your business? Um, and again, we'll be talking about kind of some of the measures that you can put in place to try and reduce that risk to you and your business and your data. Um, and then the final stat here, and I think this is quite an important one, hence why I put it on here, which is 22% of UK organizations, they don't actually provide their employees with regular security awareness training, uh, you know, be it emails, be it for um, other uh, features on the uh, on, on the network and and i think this is a big one because when we look at you know the stats that are out there 90 percent of ransomware attack malware attack normally those those take place because of an end user that's clicked on something that they shouldn't have done or maybe a contractor clicking on something that they shouldn't have done and then obviously um the next steps follow the ransomware attack etc as well okay so kind of like just going through um a bit of an overview so the so we kind of appreciate that the security threats are evolving and many of those are now sponsored by hostile you know states um actors such as russia china iran north korea uh with recent events such as the Solidate or uh, the covid research attacks where these are good examples of organized state activity uh, where these you know, typically target large businesses, government agencies, um, maybe political groups, and their aim is to be disruptive, right? Sway political opinions and gain financial gains. And even if you weren't the target of these attacks, you know, your businesses can be impacted. We saw that with WannaCry, the ransomware attack a couple of years ago, uh, where this was allegedly a state-sponsored malware developed you know, by Russia to target the Ukraine utility companies. But then it ended up having a global impact, one that we saw very closely here in the UK because it impacted a lot of the NHS um, machines that were there, okay? And then in addition, you know, smaller but no less organized crimes uh, or criminal groups, should I say, target businesses such as the SMB space uh, with ransomware attacks. And, you know, really, I guess to help combat these evolving threats, countries have actually identified the need for security recommendations based on real world uh, activity and current threat profiling. So in the UK, um, the National Cyber Security Center, which is also known as the NCSE, which is a government based body and part of also the, uh, the GCHQ advising on information security threats uh, to stay current, you know, they're there are also legal requirements for information security incidents to be reported to the NCSE. Again, this is done direct, you know, indirectly through the ICO, uh, a regulatory body uh, for GDPR uh, and also the NIS. The US has its own body, which is known as the CISA. Um, but you know, again, many European countries also have um, advice broadly similar to what the NCSE is going to be giving you as well. So when we talk about the NCSE approach, um, you know, the NCSE is the single point of contact for all digital threats in the UK. Uh, they use and collect this information in order to provide advice and guidance to businesses utilizing information technology in the UK. And they informed of, you know, the volume, the types of attacks and determine the security recommendations based on this as well. So one such example of this is going to be the guidance in the form of cyber essentials, the certification, which is updated regularly based on recommendations from the NTSC. And most recently, with increased numbers in people working you know, from home due to COVID-19, which has meant a change in security recommendations for those employees you know, that are now currently working from home. There's also a variety of frameworks and regulations that target improvements and in information standards right for companies and in the uk the main framework uh, and standards for information security is actually the iso 27001 um, the us has an equivalent which is the nist cyber security framework we're seeing that being adapted by a lot of companies because of the five pillars that they uh, kind of you know uh, construct around but both of these frameworks describe a detailed approach to identify information security risk right then going ahead and creating policies controls processes to reduce that security risk across your company, uh, covering information, you know, people, technology, physical controls. Um, and I guess the ISO 27001 is also a standard that can be certified against as well. Okay. So if we move on from there, I guess, you know, what does the NTSC advise to protect against 
uh, you know, a question I get asked a lot of the times. And, and you know, I guess the guidance of the NTSC is, is wide ranging. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of recommended controls covered by cyber essentials. Uh, but if we also kind of look and map it towards the NIST cybersecurity framework, this is where you kind of get a good idea of, of kind of the areas that you should be looking to protect your business against. So when we talk about identify, we're talking about, you know, be aware of and manage the risk in your people, the data, assets, and the environment. Protect, we're looking at controls and compliances, training, mitigation, endpoint protection. Okay, detect would be continuously monitoring right? Vulnerability and event detection, verification. Respond, we're looking at, you know, collecting information, determine exposure, contain and prevent, having playbooks in place, uh, you know, and using mitigation. And then the final pillar, the recover pillar is, you know, restore service and data and also improvements that could be made as well. Now, CIT have a great product line. Um, you know, they've got tools for all of these principles. Um, the good security is also about continually review, reviewing and checking your managed uh, environments, right? Which is a key part of the security framework. So I mentioned earlier on that a ransomware attack occurs every 19 seconds. Well, last year, in fact, it actually dropped down to 14 seconds. And in a recent study, it was found that globally a ransomware attack actually occurs every 11 seconds, right? And, you know, to give you guys a, an idea of a ransomware attack, Okay, so when we talk of a ransomware attack, there's actually five phases to a ransomware attack. And imagine this is your business, your data, and if I'm the bad actor and I've launched a ransomware attack on your business, and really cyber criminals, they first, you know, they've got to get a vulnerable employee or other individuals to execute uh, and, you know, really take that impacted file uh, and execute it in the environment. And this is typically done via social engineering techniques uh, that use either phishing, spam, emails, or, you know, they can get other types of export kits as well, right? So this is where that training, uh, security awareness training will be really important for your employees, making them aware of emails coming from outside of the organization, uh, clicking on files that they don't really expect to see, um, you know, I've seen all kinds of stuff in the past where people have uh, dropped a USB stick outside of the building just as a test for their employees. And it would have a label on there, pay rise 2021. And how many employees would actually go and pick up the USB stick and plug it into their machine, double click on an Excel file within there. Could be something malicious on that, right? Um, the second phase really is the delivery and the execution. So in this part of the process, ransomware is executed into the company system. And then persistent mechanisms that work to keep it there are installed, right? Uh, well, and there could be a number of payloads, et cetera, malware that could be deployed at this point as well. And then really phase three, uh, just a few seconds really after phase two as well. So in order to further cripple, you know, your uh, strategies that you may have in place uh, to be basically combat the threat that's taken place, the ransomware Trojan now targets and deletes the company backup files. Right, so again, this is really important and Simon will cover this off later on, but having a good backup uh, solution in place is, is step one, but then also having various copies of that. Do you have a copy locally? Do you have a copy in the cloud? Do you keep a copy of your backups in a separate building offsite? So these should be questions that you should be asking yourself, okay? Because if you're already keeping the backups locally, you, you can bet your money on it that the ransomware or the Trojan would come into there and start deleting those backup files. Okay, phase four file encryption. So once all the backups are compromised, this is where ransomware establishes encryption keys that will be used to unlock files once a victim or yourself pays the ransom uh, demands. Uh, the malware then performs a secure key ex exchange, you know, with the command and control server to establish further lockdowns um, in the company's uh, or the local system as such. And then phase five is is a user notification and cleanup process, right? So with the company backup uh, capabilities compromised and ransomware encryption legwork complete, I guess the victim now receives a ransom note with the demands to pay in exchange for the company files. Sometimes a company will be given a couple of days for this exchange, right? So they may be quite lenient and compassionate and say to you, well, actually, you know, we'll give you five days to think about this. 
right? During which time you're kind of like trying to work with your IT teams to see is there anything else that you can do. Um, and, you know, I guess you're uh, in, in those five days, you're also running a business without any of your valuable files, data, like, you know, it's really going to be a struggle for you guys to obviously maintain your normal day to day and during this period. And after that initial demand phase phases out, this is where the cyber criminals, you know, they'll often demand even more ransom, right? So they've been leaning it with you. And now it's kind of like, well, think of those penalty notices, pay within the first 14 days and we'll halve it. After that, you're going to get the full throttle and we want the full um, ransom from you. Okay. Um, and there's certain examples. There was an example in the US, uh, Kansas Hospital, uh, which they were attacked and they refused uh, to even return the victim's uh, data unless a second ransom was paid. So sometimes they can kind of extort you for additional uh, money. Because if you, um, you know, maybe you go in there and you pay um, the ransom up front, at that point they could turn around and say to you, well, that was just the initial payment. Now we want a further 2 million from you uh, in order to receive the keys for the data. Right. Um, so from here, what we'll do is let's kind of look at another stat over here. So, you know, out of, well, 51 organizations have suffered a ransomware attack and on average um, organize, organizations experience a three day uh, downtime as a result of that. Again, how's that gonna impact your business? If you're hit with ransomware and you had to shut the business down for three days, what financial implication is that gonna do for you and your business, right? Um, so again, just giving you guys some, um, some kind of information. These these these, this, these aren't scare tactics. Please don't see this as as I'm I'm throwing a lot of um, kind of numbers and figures and and telling you you know it's all doom and gloom out there. It's not. Um, you know this is all about making you guys aware of the threats that are happening. Uh, businesses that you know have been targeted uh, based on their uh, financial sectors or or you know um, based on kind of what they do as a business. I would say right. So one thing that, um, you know, I, I will say ransomware has always been making the headlines. Like wherever we go, we hear a different story of a business being hit with ransomware. Um, but when we think of bad actors and, you know, a lot of them have been reaping in far more rewards under, and, and they go under the radar through business email compromise, right? Um, we saw nettings of at least 17 times more um, per incident than ransomware and business email compromise is relatively a low tech kind of financial fraud, but yet yields high returns for scammers with minimal risk, really, right? Um, and business email compromise was the number one source of financial loss due to internet related crimes in 2019. Uh, and it was also by some margin that that was as well. So when we talk about what is business email compromise, well, business email compromise is a type of fraud in which an organization, you know, are tricked into making, you know, wide transfers to a third party uh, that they falsely believe is a legitimate external supplier um, or someone that they, um, you know, have been dealing with but have a new bank account, for example. And there's really 10 steps behind this in terms of um, how a bad actor may go about this. So the step one is the research part. So as a bad actor, they start hunting for an exploitable weakness or opportunity. And then in step two, once they identify a target based on their research, this is where the bad actor decides what angle are they going to try and exploit and which organizations are they going to target as well. And step three, they build a persona. So through web research, um, maybe the bad actor can identify board members uh, in that target organization. Step four, once they've identified a victim, they next, they look for an individual uh, at that target organization who the bad actor wants to trick. And this usually is someone that works in finance or an account payable person. Step five, uh, they spoof their email address, right? So this is where things get really interesting because the um, attack starts with an email that appears to come from a senior leader in the business. So the bad actor first tries a targeted phishing, aka a spear phishing attack or credential threat through key loggers installed on the machine, for example. Um, and, you know, this is where a C-suite executive may uh, be targeted um, with a phishing attack that installs a remote access Trojan, uh, otherwise known as a rat in the security world, um, to harvest credentials or other, 
you know, useful business information that the bad actor can use. Step six, they personalize an email. So the bad actor now puts all of their research and persona building to good work here, right? Creating a email that appears to come from a senior leader. Uh, they add personalization into it, that email. So potentially like the assignment, for example, uh, the reference specific events, so whether it's recent press releases, um, and they're also going to request the money transfer as well at this point. Okay. Step seven, the, they isolate the victim, right? So isolation is a popular technique uh, to put pressure on the victim and then stop them from checking in with others. Uh, so if you don't have processes in place around how money should be um, you know, transferred to an, an account, whether there's a policy in place, if it's over X amount, then it needs to go through various approvals, regardless of who's requesting that money, right? But here's where, you know, we see common phrases included, right? Like this is a confidential email. Don't share this with anyone else. I'm only trusting you to do this, right? Which puts a bit of onus on you. Um, maybe, you know, this is highly sensitive. Or another one is where they apply agency, where they say this is urgent and needs to be done in the next hour right, where it kind of now tricks you into thinking, ah, this is coming in from the owner or someone high up where, you know, I need to get this done. Step eight, you know, this is where we avoid um, any follow-ups. So the bad actors don't want the victim checking in with senior leaders. Um, so they discourage them by making them seem uh, as though they're unavailable uh, by saying, hey, look, I'm out of the office for the rest of the day. Or, um, you know, they, they also target people based on when they're on annual leave, right? So I'm out of the office on vacation, but I forgot to do this before I left. Please, can you do this for me? Don't disturb me because I've got limited email access, but it needs to be done today, okay? Uh, step nine, uh, obviously this is where they provide, the bad actor is gonna provide their bank details. Um, so the bank account is probably one of the bad actor's biggest expenses. So they only share their bank details once they've hooked the victim, right? With their spoofed emails. And then step 10, this is where it, you know, the money transfer happens. It's game over for the business because obviously the money has been transferred now to the bad actor, never to be seen again, of course. And you know, soon someone will notice the big hole in the bank account, and that's when the alarm bells go off ringing. Okay, um, and that's typically what a business email compromise looks like. There's also many different types of this um, example. Uh, this is just one example to you. Um, another example could be uh, one that I saw take place. Um, so on, on on this one, uh, this was a targeted attack on a business. Um, I won't give any names out, of course, on the business itself, um, but it's really simple to do, right? Um, step one would be to get a list of all employees. Now, imagine that I'm going to you know, target your business. I need to get a list of all the employees that work at your business. How can I do this? Well, when I first was asked this question, I suggested LinkedIn, but actually there's a far more easier way to get a list of employees. I can simply use uh, Google hacking, right? Um, another name for this is called Google stalking. Um, it's a hacker technique that uses Google searches and other Google applications to find security holes. But now I've got a list of all the employees that have worked at that company. My next step here is to really get the email address format. Again, I'm going to use the same um, the same application. I'm going to use Google hacking to basically get me a list. It's just uh, Google Dokken is basically where you put in certain commands in Google, which basically then give you a list of what you're looking for. So in this example, I'll be looking for um, the domain name for your business, which is going to give me uh, the email format for your uh, organization. Step three, really, I need to get a signature, right? So I've now got a list of all the employees that have worked at your business. I now have the email address format, but when I'm going to be sending in an email pretending to be someone, I obviously need to have a signature, right? So again, a couple of ways that I can do this. I can actually, um, you know, one of the most common ways, believe it or not, is I could be someone genuinely interested in some of your services. So I go to your website, I'm having a browse around, and there's actually a form on the website which says, hey, for more information, we'll send you a booklet um, on, on our services. And I fill in my details, um, or maybe I, I put in fake information and set up a fake email address, and I get an email back from you with the brochure, et cetera, and information, hey, thanks for visiting our website. Here's the latest brochure that we have, uh, assigned by Andy, my auto bot that is responding back from the web page. But of course, at the end of that, 
is the signature, which is all I'm interested in. So I now have the signature and I have the email list um, and the name of the employees. My next step is to mirror the website that you guys have or maybe the portal. I remember, I'm the bad actor who's done a bit of investigating so I understand what applications you guys are using, whether it's a CRM tool, whether it's a system that you use for your HR talent processing, like whatever it is that you guys are using, maybe it's Office 365 uh, that you use. And I can basically find tools on the dark web that are gonna mirror your website, right? Uh, and in particular, I'm looking to mirror the login page. So now that I've done that, and, and, and again, guys, I've seen this, it's, it's literally, it doesn't take long to mirror a website, right? I'm not redesigning the whole website. I'm literally clicking a couple of buttons that's gonna copy, copy that original site and mirror it into my domain, okay? Um, and, and again, the way that this is done is once I mirror the website, I could purchase a domain that looks very similar to your domain. Uh, example of this could be, we'll use the BBC, for example. The BBC website is www.bbc.co.uk. I could purchase the .com version of that if BBC didn't own it and if that was available, and I could use www.bbc.com. Maybe, you know, I want to change it to, let's just say the .com address had gone, and I, the closest I can get to it is www.bbbc.com or .co.uk. Again, I could purchase that and I associate that with the mirrored website that I've just taken. And now from here, what I do is I compile an email to target the employees, right? So this is the bit where, uh, which, which it becomes social engineered. Um, and it's also done at a time when um, maybe the person sending the email is out of the office. So as much as I've gained access to their emails or, you know, I'm setting up a, a an email that's coming from a slightly different email address to the employees going out to them. And this is really where, you know, we apply that technique that I used in the previous slide where we're applying, you know, pressure to say to the employees, dear so-and-so, um, I've noticed that you haven't added in your, um, you know, the, the data from the previous week and it needs to be added in by the end of play today. Make sure you do this or the buys is going to be, um, you know, disciplinary actions taken or whatever it may be, right? Um, and at this point, obviously, there's a link in the email that I've provided. So I'm kind of being helpful. Make sure you log in here to uh, fill in that information. So as the victim, I click on the link that's going to take me to this mirrored website, which is going to look exactly the same as you would if you were signing into your original uh, application. I type in my username, my password. I hit enter. That screen refreshes. And all of a sudden, I've got the login screen again. Okay, so as an end user, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I typed in the wrong password. Let me try it again. So I type in the password, username, and password again. Hit enter. I'm now into the system, and I continue working, and whatever that's done. As the bad actor, what's actually happened there was the link took the victim to the mirrored website, which they typed in their username and password. And at that point, when they hit enter, those credentials were captured. So now as the bad actor, I can go to the original website, I can log in as that victim, and now I have access to all the data in that company. Okay, so I guess in terms of what we've learned from today, right, is that your approach to cybersecurity should be a multi-layered approach. Having the right tools in place is one step, uh, but it can still leave you open to, comp to be compromised. You need to make sure that you're doing things like, you know, providing security awareness training for your employees, having processes in place, right? Like when someone leaves the business, do you immediately advise your IT team to disable those accounts? Do you wait a set amount of days uh, before you send that email request off? You know, who has access to what files? Is there an audit done? Do you check who has access to what information, right? As people work from um, home, um, are they transferring data to their personal machines, which if they then got hit with ransomware and that information was captured, what does that mean for you and your business? Um, so really that is where, um, you know, I guess the next part of the presentation, which Simon's going to go through, we'll talk about how uh, Complete IT can help you. Thanks very much, Patesh, for that. So yes, um, just to get my screen working. So, um, you know, so obviously Patesh has talked about the kind of threat landscape. Obviously, we're fully aware of the threats out there and like to help our clients 
you know, be as safe as possible and put as uh, much protection in so that they don't fall victim to a cyber attack. So what can complete IT find, you know, what do we find at our clients and what do we recommend? To start with, we look, we can look at the seven layers of cyber security. It's important to have a layered approach as Protesh was saying to cyber security, because the more layers you have in place, the more resilience you have. So, you know, first of all, physical security. If we look at this, this will be actually your office location. So nothing to do with your IT equipment, but you'll be surprised how many people could just walk unannounced into an office with a high-vis jacket on. High-vis jacket does a lot to get you into places. So you might not find that very common where you've been, but you know people do not always query when they see an unknown person walking around. And if someone walks in, they can quickly plug something into a network and then they're in, that's it. And then network security, this is all about the, the secure configuration of your servers, your endpoints, your switches, et cetera. Moving on to passwords and two-factor authentication, you know, password hygiene is important and 2FA is imperative for all uh, services that we provide our users now. And then backups, again, a big area. Protesh touched on that. Um, are they consistent? Are we taking them off site? If we get a problem, we need to make sure we can recover for our environments. And patches and settings, and this is not just for endpoints servers, it's for all devices that you use within your infrastructure. There's always security holes that need to be patched and we need to ensure that we've got processes in place to cover these. And then finally, the social engineering piece, which I just talked a lot about that and in the last piece around how, you know, fake forms uh, can affect, um, allow people into an organisation or into an infrastructure. So there's a big education piece we now need to consider for all of our users. So a typical SME for complete IT, what we would generally find when we take someone on or a new client on and on, uh, review their infrastructure is plenty of end of life operating systems. Now these may be functioning correctly, but of course, when Microsoft have taken these out of support, they no longer provide patching and security updates for them. So there's a hole straight away. And of course, if we're working remotely, which a lot of us are now, then you know, that's a greater risk. So we should always ensure that our operating systems are patched to the latest level. Uh, and then that brings us on to the patching in itself. Generally, we find this is completely out of date. It's very um, uh, bitty, especially around non-operating uh, system products. So there's a, a big piece of work we always have to do around patching. Backups, always inconsistent. So um, we'll find you know, not all of the devices or systems are backed up. It looks like it's working, it's not. So there's generally lots of businesses that don't have proper backups in place. And of course, that leads on to very little in disaster recovery plans or planning. Without the backups, you can't have a proper disaster recovery plan and obviously bring your systems back from a cyber attack or from something like a firewall flood. And firewalls, every business has them. And generally, these have been poorly configured, uh, not maintained. Um, and that now goes on with little or no email security. You know, everyone's got a standard spam filter, but that is really isn't enough these days. And again, going on from what Pratesha says, you know, lots of um, the biggest target is email for to be compromised in order for an attacker to gain access to your infrastructure. So we have to do a lot with email now. And then antivirus, unmanaged, uh, not monitored, you know, alerts not reviewed, etc. So there's potential for issues around there. And finally, poor password hygiene. Um, we see this all over the place, shared passwords, uh, short passwords, passwords not being changed, etc. Um, and of course, it's really difficult to enforce that sometimes. So there's a, a big piece around education on that as well. Now, a lot of these areas can be vastly improved with very little cost. You know, we're SMEs, we, we, we provide support for SME clients. So they haven't always got bags of money to spend on the latest and greatest um, software and technologies, but we can do a lot of little things uh, to get a greater level of protection. Uh, so as a minimum for operating systems and patching, we would always ensure that your operating systems are in support. Um, the, I mean, we still have clients that are running a lot of Windows 7 now. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard to move away, but this isn't really a legacy operating system. And as I said a minute ago, it's out of support. So we need to ensure that we do move these to modern Windows 10 versions or, or you know, maybe even Linux, Mac, whatever you, you might be using, because that way we know that we're going to get patches of support. Centralized patching is, in, is important. Microsoft provide a couple of ways, a traditional software update service, which is kind of getting towards a bit legacy now, but a more modern Windows update for business service, which they provide as part of their Microsoft 365 uh, licensing. 
much greater way of controlling and managing the patching of all your devices, even where no matter where your devices are in the office or working maybe at the home. And of course, regular reporting and patching levels. So you've got a good overview of what um, the level of your uh, patching throughout your uh, end user and server estate. Now, the ideal recommendation, and as MSP, what we do for our clients is provide a remote management and monitoring tool, an agent that sits on each device, server and end user device, and it automates the patching for them, that we manage complete IT and that we monitor and maintain to ensure that all of their devices are up to date uh, and address anything that isn't. And this also actually includes third party patching. It's important also those common other applications such as the Google, the Firefoxes, the Adobe's, et cetera, that these are kept up to date as well because they're open to vulnerabilities just like Microsoft operating systems. And then of course, you'll get your visual overview and configurable alerting around it all. And of course, an RMM isn't just for updating, it's for you know, obviously support purposes, monitoring of devices, you can you know, manage, uh, manage software deployments, et cetera. But a good thing about it is of course, it, it works no matter where your endpoints are. So where we're working from lots of different locations, uh, as long as they've got an internet connection, we've got a visual on it and we can update it. So moving on to backup and disaster recovery, a big area, um, another layer. Um, as a minimum, clearly we need to ensure backup is up to software is up to date. And there's going to be a trend here with keeping things up to date, of course. Backup software, again, you need to keep up to date, you get the latest features, it should be under maintenance and you get support from it. And the number of infrastructures we see that do show 100% complete on their backup, but actually they haven't accommodated all of their systems or data. And of course, that means that their key systems or key systems can be vulnerable. If they fail, we can't recover them. And they may fall out of the required retention they have to keep. For example, in a, a accounts data, um, you might need to keep that for a number of years even, and then you're falling outside of your industry requirements. So it's important that to look and review your backup, even though it might be showing as 100% complete and successful, it might not be accommodating everything that you need to back up. And even if you do accommodate everything you back up, it's important to undertake regular tests to recover it, because how do you know you can recover it? It might say 100% complete on the backup, but we have you tested it? So we need to look at that and then ensure that this will meet your recovery point objectives via your retention you've implemented and also your recovery time objectives. So how quickly do you need to get your key systems back up and does it meet that? Um, and a really important piece, which still a lot of businesses don't do, is taking their data off site. Um, if you have a file flood or a ransomware attack that might encrypt all your backup files, then without some offsite or secure data, um, you are liable to be unable to recover your entire system. Uh, so you should have some a secure methods to take data off site. And then finally, of course, you need to have a proper formal tested and written disaster recovery plan in place. Now, backup products have moved on greatly over the years. Um, you know, the traditional take drive and backup software is gone. Uh, well, it's still around, but it's, it's, it's not much in use. And the, the, the number of backup products now that provide a level of automation for disaster recovery and backup and auto healing, et cetera, is, is immense. So if you're using a kind of older backup environment, we would really recommend that you implement a solution or look at a solution that can provide you with a full platform to cover all of your servers, uh, perform automated test recoveries, uh, provide a way to take data off site uh, and provide the kind of full disaster recovery platform that you need so that if you have a problem with your office location, you can still uh, bring up your environment in a temporary location elsewhere provided by the backup provider uh, so you can continue to work. And this also may be the case if you have a massive ransomware attack, you might need to use that to spin up your environment to keep your business running and your users working. Now, move on to firewall, um, something again, every business has, and as with everything, keep it up to date. Generally, we will find when we review firewalls, there's a huge rule set that's completely uh, out of date and hasn't been maintained. There's lots of incoming inbound rules that are no longer valid, and that's obviously presenting a, a cyber risk uh, for uh, someone to exploit. And then, also, we find a lot of the time that there's lots of services published out to the internet. And you should really use an encrypted VPN for this. So reduce the rule set down, make sure they're all valid and use an encrypted VPN to allow remote workers if needed. And also for users inside your network, limit what they need to browse. Obviously, I'm not just talking about uh, the types of websites, but actually 
uh, the types of traffic that they need to access. People will generally need just the web browse, but ransomware, if it's inside your network, will talk back to its base on sometimes strange, what are known as ports, TCP ports, and if limiting down what your firewall will allow outbound will actually limit what could be copied by a potential ransomware attack. And of course, the ideal recommendation that we would recommend is implementing a next generation firewall, which will provide all of the regular firewall features, but then look at analyzing the traffic through uh, intrusion prevention and uh, stateful packet inspection, analyzing what's coming in and out and seeing if there's anything malicious within it. It will provide things like gateway antivirus. So before your devices browse the website, it will analyze those for any kind of embedded malware, um, allow you to implement web filtering and reputation, look at the reputation of websites and other things like application control and as many others. Uh, things that you can do with these as well. Now, email protection, one of the biggest pieces um, that we need to concentrate on now. Email is um, the largest target for in, you know, mal malware infections, people clicking on links, people opening suspicious attachments, uh, people opening spoofed emails like uh, Protesh was talking about, or you know, lookalike domains. Um, you know, someone could buy a domain for complete IT. So instead of complete hyphen IT, complete hyphen LIT, lt.co.uk. And if you've got someone's name and signature, then you can make a, a very easily create a domain um, or an email that looks very similar to uh, the real person. So we need to now to protect against all of these types. Now, there's something very simple you can do. Um, which doesn't cost anything, and that's implementing a few records. Um, I mean, I, I think these days most people have these, but it's worth mentioning. SPF, which will actually, an incoming email server will check all the email it receives to make sure it's come from a legitimate source. That doesn't cost anything to implement. DKIM, that will mean that every email that your system sends will be uh, stamped with a, a secure signature, and then the receiving email server will decrypt that and check that it's come from a legitimate source and that the contents hasn't been changed since it left the source. And then finally, DMARC, which combines both of the above and will um, ensure that they are both are above their past and also has additional controls in it that uh, tells the receiving email server how to treat email if it fails any of its checks. So those are simple things you can put in place that will help your email domains be more secure and also that you can put in place on your email system to check when you receive email. And that can take away a certain level of spoofed email for you. But the biggest thing you need to do, or well, three things, is uh, implement an advanced email security uh, product. Now, this isn't just your regular spam filter that uses known remote block lists or set of rules to lists for specific content within emails. It's all around identifying phishing and spear phishing attempts, looking at those impersonated domains or those you know, the similar domains that people may have purchased, um, detecting emails that have been received from comp compromised accounts. And a modern email security platform will also use AI to evaluate changes in behavior. So the way people communicate within the business and it will concentrate on uh, specific employees, directors, people in accounts, looking at signatures they haven't seen their types of job role and highlight things and sudden changes in inbox rule analysis, etc. Now, this is massively important now because the email threats that we see have got so advanced that it's going to be it gets really difficult sometimes, even for someone who's cyber aware to spot these, especially in a busy day of working and or more likely now when they're working remotely and can't check with a colleague if this looks suspicious or not. And then to complement that, you want to provide your employees with user awareness training so that they can help identify or train them on how to identify suspicious emails, what to look for in an email. Obviously, not everyone's got the technical brain, so just providing a few pointers on how uh, to spot a potentially fraudulent email um, or on how to report it and what to do if they think there's a problem. And then to complement that, we would undertake regular spoof simulations with your employees so that you, they can understand um, what people are doing with emails. And these, these spoof emails might uh, contain um, a link that goes off to a, a, an impersonated website. So we can then track what these, each of your users do, whether they open an email, whether they look at the content, whether they click the link, whether they actually then enter credentials into the spoofed website. And these are all give you um, a good layer of protection on your email, which is, that, like I said, the entry point for a lot of modern uh, malware. Uh, logons. Now, of course, there's many issues with uh, username and passwords for access systems. 
Um, and within a business, employees generally have multiple usernames and passwords to remember credentials for, and that kind of leads to poor password hygiene. Um, you know, even if people are asked to change their passwords, they generally change it to something less complex in order so that they don't forget it. Um, there's not always complexity requirements in place, and there's obviously shared and default passwords in use. We've seen it, you know, passwords written on yellow post-it notes and left on screens for people when they're on holiday, etc. And then people that are untrained employees that don't understand cybersecurity, and not all people will, why would they? Um, but of course they pose a risk because they're not aware of the risks they pose when, um, you know, using simple passwords, leaving passwords to be shared, et cetera. And with the huge uptake in uh, SaaS platforms such as Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace, um, you know, with, uh, with these platforms being accessible from the internet everywhere, they are susceptible for brute force attempts, i.e. some an attacker trying many combinations of usernames and passwords in order to gain access to an infrastructure. And we've seen it, we've seen it with our clients where access is um, someone's brute forced in and then they, they sit inside the network and put forwarders in an emails, inbox rules, uh, and then they learn how people communicate and then they can socially engineer their way into essentially gaining financially from it. Now, it doesn't mean to say that obviously SaaS platforms are uh, insecure, far from it, but because they're available on the internet, we need to do more to secure that access. Um, and a username and password is not secure enough on its own now to control access. So three kind of areas we want to touch on. First, two-factor or multi-factor authentication. It's imperative for everything now, um, especially with online services. You must have that two-factor enabled and for Google, for Microsoft and, and you know things like Salesforce, they're all uh, options that you can enable for free of charge. And it's not a case of having to enter a, a, another form of authentication every time you open Outlook or open Google, if, once you've got your device trusted, but it protects against that brute force element. So even if an attacker has your correct username and password, they still can't get into your environment. And then to get around the multiple combinations of usernames and passwords that people generally have of different systems, it's good to look at a single sign-on solution. So as an example, uh, we can use, say, the Microsoft 365 user directory to authenticate access to third-party applications. So if you use things like Dropbox and Salesforce, you can integrate those into Microsoft 365 authentication so that when people log on to them, they have the one username and the one password. And then, of course, those are also protected by the multi-factor authentication. And then to further that, conditional access. Now, conditional access is a Microsoft 365 thing, but there's versions of it for Google, et cetera. But this allows us to control access to our online platforms. So where I said 365 is available from all over the world, which of course it is, we can actually use conditional access to limit how people access your Microsoft 365 or Google or whatever it is tenant. And we can do things such as limiting access to business devices only. So machines or laptops supplied by the business, or we can actually block specific locations or countries, or we can actually just limit it down to we can only access our services from within our office location. So it brings it right down. And so introducing conditional access, SSO and MFA vastly reduces the uh, uh, attack surface for uh, potential um, compromises and you can become quite very secure very quickly by implementing these features and as i say if you've got microsoft 365 or google you've got these features more than likely with your licensing already so it's something that's worth investigating now moving on to endpoints um endpoints you know it's become more of a topic now given that we're working in lots of different locations in the past 12 months and probably will be for the next 12 um, so lots of remote locations, and of course, these aren't protected by uh, a proper, you know, next generation firewall or a firewall, business grade firewall. Um, and as with email, cyber attackers are getting a lot more intelligent on how they attack us. Um, you know, if, if a malware enters your devices, it no longer suddenly presents itself and you notice as a problem, it kind of sits there in the background gathering information about you, your device, uh, other things on the network. Uh, and what you're doing and sending information to back to home, back to the malware home, if you like. And of course, traditional antivirus is no longer adequate enough to support these modern threats. So what we need to do now is look at a modern endpoint detect and response tool, EDR. 
And this changes away, it moves away from the traditional antivirus that uses signatures for known threats and now uses artificial intelligence to evaluate processes and behaviors on your devices. So it will be able to identify those zero day attacks that a signature based antivirus will, won't even touch. It can then obviously quarantine suspicious files and stop suspicious activity. And that suspicious activity might be uh, legitimate processes on your devices being used by an attacker to gather data. So when you know, your Windows laptops, your standard Windows laptop will have lots of tools on it that you're able to use to gather data about what's happening on it. And attackers commonly now use those to gain intel on what your network contains, et cetera. And then an EDR can actually identify that and put a stop to it because it's nothing suspicious to a normal antivirus or to you, but um, it's, it seems out of the ordinary for an EDR. So it will put a pause on that. And of course, if it stops something that's, that is legitimate, then you know, you can you can unquarantine or, or whitelist it, but it goes that much a step further to um, analysing what attacks are happening on your devices and, and protects you against those zero day attacks. Now, in addition, certain EDRs can be um, used to block complete access to your network. So if there's a large attack defined on the server or on an endpoint, um, it will actually block the network access so that it no longer presents a threat to anything else, which is really quite nice. And then there's certain things like rollback features for endpoints. So whereas before, if your device has been attacked um, and it had to be rebuilt, now with certain EDRs, we can roll that back to a time before the attack and the user can carry on working. And then there's additional controls somebody else can provide. So Protest touched on plugging in unknown USB disk drives that you might find on the street that have a kind of a uh, wording on them that makes you want to plug them in so we can actually block things like mass storage devices so people can't plug in usb disks unless they're authorized etc and of course edr can protect both endpoints and servers um, and then finally cyber essentials now i'm sure a lot of you have heard of this but it's a government back scheme to ensure businesses adopt good security practices and it kind of concentrates on these five areas that are listed here and a lot of this is obviously covered in what we've just discussed but in addition to this there's uh, cyber essentials requires that you have a lot of policies uh, documented processes procedures and forms in place so then for example with firewall changes you have a documented process for any changes you need so you need to remove or add rules and the documenting the reasons why so when you when users come and go you document uh, have a documented process for that so you're making sure you're removing access to people that no longer need it etc and kind of a lot of uh, procedures around all of that so with and you know, including your patch management etc as well so with having all these procedures in place and with putting those layers of security and meeting the criteria of cyber essentials you'll have a great number of layers of security in place in order to help prevent uh, you becoming a victim to a cyber attack nothing is of course 100 percent guaranteed um, but the, as many layers as possible you put into place then you're much less likely to be affected by this. So just to flip back to those seven layers of cybersecurity, the physical security, uh, if we undertake our cyber essentials requirements, then we'll be able to ensure we have processes for ensuring that the people that enter our office are only authorized. Our network security is covered, covered with by uh, updating our firewalls and making sure they're configured correctly, implementing an RMM tool to manage our patching, have configuration and policies in place via cyber essentials and we will secure our email via a dedicated email security tool. Our passwords and two-factor authentication are dealt with by the use of single sign-on, uh, obviously using the MFA that's provided for free for us, restricting how services are accessed and then following the guidance from cyber essentials on password hygiene. Backups we protect, ensure that we protect all our backups, protect all our systems and data uh, ensure that all the backups are encrypted and been able to take off site and that our backup has been tested and we have a full DR plan. Uh, patching and settings, we patch all of our servers and endpoints with our RMM, RMM tool we've implemented. We patch our network devices um, and we follow the cyber essentials requirements about and policies for keeping all of these up to date. And finally, for social engineering, we look at the user awareness training and also call simulations for emails. Uh, and running those on a regular basis. And with all of those in place, although, like as I said, we can't guarantee 100%, you won't fall victim to a cyber attack, 
you've got a lot of layers in place uh, to protect you. So uh, we've reached uh, the end of the um, webinar today, but I think Jess might have uh, questions that have been asked. Yeah, thank you very much. We have got a few questions that have come in. Um, talking about backup systems, how well do you rate Gatto backup facility and its ability to block unauthorized access? Uh, data, yeah, so it, uh, data, but yeah, so data have their own RMM, but data backup has a ransomware detection tool within it. Um, it actually doesn't analyze any files, it analyzes the changes in files. So it's, it's not like the EDR that I just talked about where it looks at suspicious behavior. It looks at for sudden mass changes between backups. And because Datto takes a backup frequently, maybe once an hour, it could quite quickly and, and find um, that if a lot of chart files have changed their content in a short space of time, that's when it highlights. So um, by that time, if, if there's been a sudden change, obviously it, it detects it, but it's probably too late. But of course, the advantage of a Datto as a backup and disaster recovery product is that you've got many, many in, um, recovery points so you can quickly recover your data. Brilliant. Um, we've been looking at ISO 27001. Would Cyber Essentials help towards that? Uh, yeah, so ISO 27001 is a big beast of compliance and procedures, but um, Cyber Essentials is a, a, a kind of, I wouldn't say lesser, it is a lesser version, it's a much more uh, a version of uh, compliance that you can achieve in a, a much quicker time scale, but does cover off all those areas that we discussed. So it's something that you should definitely look to achieve as a business. And if you're going to do that, I would go for the Cyber Essentials Plus, um, and that essentially adds on an external check um, of what you've got in place to ensure that it does actually meet the criteria. And, and that's good for you, you know, being able to then to report to your clients because they then know that you've been checked and you do uh, adopt good security practices with your data and your infrastructure. Brilliant. Um, how would you recommend we educate our employees around cybersecurity, I guess? Yeah, well, there's many platforms out there that are dedicated to uh, uh, for user awareness training. Uh, there's lots of companies that have created specific content around different cyber threats uh, and, and GDPR and you know other things like well-being, et cetera. That, and you can essentially provide the platform to your users, target them specific types of training, and then you can even have them uh, take um, tests on it. It's basic tests on it afterwards to make sure they've understood it. And if, you know, if they haven't, then they can rerun the videos and, until they get to a certain level. Um, so there's, I mean, obviously, if you, if you want to go further with that, we can recommend uh, some platforms to you. We use them ourselves because uh, complete IT or I say 27,000 are accredited. So we undertake regular um, user awareness training and simulations ourselves. So um, you'll need to dedicate a platform for it. OK, I'm conscious we're uh, very nearly on top. Uh um, full time. What sort of budget should a business allow for cybersecurity management? Oh, it's this. It couldn't. Can, sorry, it can be an open book. Sorry, just some disappeared. It can be an open book. It, it completely depends on um, the size. Sorry, the size of your business, uh, the number of endpoints, and what you're investing in. I mean. As I went through on the presentation, there is uh, quite a number of areas you can address and secure without any cost. It just it just needs your time and effort into putting these into place. I would suggest that you definitely should invest in an endpoint detect and response um, tool and also an email security tool. Um, and the costs in that completely uh, dictated by the number of endpoints and devices you have in your business. Um, you know, we, we can obviously provide you, talk to you further and provide you with a kind of more uh, uh, specific cost for your business. Um, but it, it completely depends on, on what you are and what you do and how your users work. Okay, and this is 
probably the last one we have time for, I'm afraid. Um, does single sign on create a problem so far as if they crack one password, they have access to multiple accounts? Doesn't it go against the perceived? Well, yeah, theoretically, yes. If, if you had that, if you didn't have MFA, but MFA is imperative. So um, if you have single sign on and someone learns a username and password, as long as MFA is in place, then um, the attacker isn't going to be able to get in. And of course, if there is a problem with an account, because you've got single sign on, you can disable that one account and it disables access to all of your systems. But you must have MFA. If you don't have that, then you're, you're, you're kind of almost an open book. Perfect. And I think that is, I'm afraid, all we've got time for on the questions. There's a couple in there that we'll get back to you um, separately. And I will be sending out all of the slides after this um, webinar, along with some other resources and things that might be useful for you to share with your teams. Thank you so much, Pratesh and Simon. Thanks. Cheers. See you next time. Thank you.